Hello, I'm Pastor Mark Biddy from Harvest Baptist Church in Dawsonville, Georgia. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for watching this YouTube video and invite you to our services here at the church. We're located at 123 John Perry Road, Dawsonville, Georgia. Our service times are Sunday morning, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, 11 o'clock morning worship, 6 o'clock evening worship. We also have a Wednesday midweek service where we meet at 7 o'clock for prayer, 7.30 for service. You can find more information about us on our website, www.harvest-baptistchurch.com. Again, thank you for watching this YouTube video. I hope it is an encouragement and a challenge to you. May the Lord bless you. I sure do appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and the privilege to stand. I, uh, I was, we was riding on the way here and uh, I've still been super, super excited and, and amazed, Brother Jeb, what God done Sunday morning. Amen. Still ain't got over it. Still, Brother Eric, I'm still chewing on it, grasping it. I just I can't get over it. I was amazed. And uh, I thank God for it. Thank God that we've been able to get in on some good services at Wahoo this week. And all the good things that God's been doing, going, been doing in our hearts and our lives and just excited. And I told Amanda on the way here, I said, my biggest fear is after all the great things that God's done, I'm going to be a big letdown tonight. And she was exactly right in what she said. She said, if you're the one standing up there alone, you will be. And I prayed and I said, I won't stand alone, that God will help us and you pray for us. The Lord be with us tonight. We sure do need his help. I don't want to let you down. I will let you down. You pray that God help us so we can say or do something, be helped to you. Now, Book of Job, chapter number one. Very, very familiar scripture. But I feel like this is where the Lord's got us this evening. I'll say as you're turning, I sure am glad one day, whether by death or by the rapture, I'm going to leave this world. I'm glad to tell you tonight, I have no worries, Brother Jeb, what's going to happen after that. Amen. I've never seen the gates of pearl, but one day I will. And Brother Charlie, better than just seeing them, I'm glad one day they're going to open them up and let me go in them. Not because of anything good I've done, not because of who I am or where I've been or where I come from, not anything to do with me, Brother Scott, but because of that precious blood. Amen. I'm thankful tonight that I get to go in. I'm thankful that he made the way possible. He done for me what I couldn't do for myself. What nobody else could do for me, I'm glad he done for me, and I am thankful for that tonight. Job chapter number one, begin reading in verse number one. The Bible said there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 5,000 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Then pick up reading verse number 13. The Bible said there was a day when the, his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men. And they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and ran his man on and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. 
and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sin not, nor charge God foolishly. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord God, as I bow my unworthy head before you once again, God, I beg you, God, to please touch us and help us. Lord, please don't leave us to ourselves. Don't let me stand alone tonight. Lord, I sure do need your touch. I need your help. Lord, I'm helpless within myself, but I pray tonight, God, that you would be high and lifted up tonight, that people wouldn't see or hear me. God, I'd hear from heaven tonight, God, that you'd be real to us, and God, the Holy Ghost would deal with our hearts and have his will and way and speak to us and draw us closer to you that we might leave here better than what that that we came. And I pray tonight, Lord, if they'd be on here lost, Lord, I don't know the hearts, but you do. I pray that God, the Holy Ghost, would deal with their hearts, Lord, and show them their need to be saved. They might get saved for it's everlasting too late. Uh, uh, Lord, I'm still a at how you done so. Uh, uh, Lord, Sunday, God, just in the midst of it all, not understanding hardly anything, but knowing that they had a need, God, that they was missing something in their heart and they had a need and, and realized through what was being said and done that you had the answers. And I'm thankful tonight, God, that you do have the answers. God, you can meet the need. Uh, I'm glad whatever, what all this world cannot offer and can't do, uh, I'm glad you can do tonight. And I pray tonight, God, you meet the needs of your people. Lord, I pray, Lord, you speak to hearts and touch and help. Lord, I I don't know what everybody's going through tonight or where everybody's at, but God, you do. And you know exactly what they need tonight. And I pray, Lord, that that's exactly what they'd get. I pray that you touch and help as only you can. And Lord, I want you to do a try our very, very best. Give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for all that you do. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we humbly pray. And amen. Amen. A very familiar scriptures I said before. I've taught on it, I've preached on it, but I feel like God had us has us be there, be here tonight. I've uh, had this passage of scripture on my heart more than I ever have before for about a year now. Ever since Brother Lee testified about it at camp last year, I've had this passage of scripture on my heart and I keep coming back to it, Brother Jim, just over and over. I keep coming back to this passage of scripture and God just keeps dealing my heart about it over and over and I get more out of it every time that I read it and study it. And So that's where God's got us once again here tonight. We know the story about Job. I'll say first of all, I can't help but notice his perfection. I want to clarify something tonight and I'm sure everybody knows this, but that doesn't mean that Job was perfect than that he was sinless. Right. That doesn't mean that Job never committed a sin or never done anything wrong. Uh, uh, Job was still human like you and I are. Job had his faults and his mess ups uh, just like you and I have. Uh, the only man that's ever lived a perfect sinless life was the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, but he was perfect and I believe in his desires. Uh, he may not have been perfect because of his humanity and his flesh and he had his mess ups. But I believe he was perfect, Brother Jeremy, because he wanted to be. He may, not, he may not always done everything exactly right, Brother Scott, but I believe he truly, earnestly, sincerely, with all of his heart, wanted to be as much as possible. I believe that's what God means here when he says he's perfect man and upright and feared God and shoot evil. He may not always had everything exactly right, but he sure did want to and he sure did try. I'm telling you, a lot of times uh, uh, we, 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 we know we're not going to be perfect. We know we're going to mess up. We know we're going to stumble and fall, but we sure could try a little bit harder every once in a while than what we do. Right. We may not always get it right. We ought to want to try to. Amen. His perfection, he, he may not have been perfect, but he sure did want to be. I believe this man wanted with all his heart to be the very best he could be for, for God and wanted to right. please God and love God with all of his heart. Uh, I, I noticed this, not only his per perfection, but God been dealing with me about this here lately. In verse number five, it talks about his children, how they, they were going feasting. And it said here in verse number five and that Job sent and sanctified them after they went for their feasting. And the Bible said, and he rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Listen to this, it said, Job said, said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. I want to notice his precaution. He said, everything looks good on the outside. As far as I know, Brother Scott, my children are okay. Everything's all right. But just in case there's something I don't know about, in case there's something in their heart that I can't see, something that I can't discern, just in case I'm still going to sacrifice, I'm still going to pray for them, I'm still going to do everything that I know and I need to do because I don't know everything. It could be something wrong in their heart that I don't know about. Just in case, just in case, I'm going to do all I can. Amen. God help us whether everything looks all right or not. 
Whether we know anything's wrong or not, we don't know their heart, we don't know where they stand, uh, uh, whether your children are grown or whether they're still young and, and don't understand yet, we ought to do all we can, uh, I mean, to our very best to see to it that we keep them uh, close to God, that we pray for them and, and pray that God takes care of them and keeps a hedge about them. And, and if they ain't saved yet, that we pray every day uh, uh, that when the time comes that God the Holy Ghost deals with their heart and shows them their need that they can get birthed in the family of God and not, not later either, but at an early age that God would keep them uh, from a lot, of, a lot of hurt and a lot of heartache and, and save them at an early age and do something true and, and something great with their life. His precaution. He said, it might be. He said, I don't know. Everything as far as I know looks okay, but just in case something's not okay, I'm going to do all I can anyway. My, what a good daddy. Oh, God help me to be a better daddy. His precaution, just in case, for the things that I don't know about. Boy, we don't know everything. Mom and Daddy done, done, done a good job. They done our best, done a good job to raise us right. They didn't always know about everything. Job said, I may not, there may be things I don't know about, so I'm going to do the best I can. Don't let our guard down just because it seems like everything's okay. Just because it seems like everything's all right, that's a real good time to, for the devil to lull you to sleep and then creep in and do things. And, and then before you know it, you're in a big mess because you did not stay precautious, did not stay on your toes, did not stay ready. His precaution. Then obviously we want to notice his pain. My, my, what pain that this man went through. I hope and pray that none of us in here tonight ever have to experience anything close to what Job went through. I, I begin to look at his pain. I mean, one right after another. Before one messenger, Brother Richard, could get done telling him what's going on, here comes another, ready and waiting in line. One after another, bad news just began to, to build and to grow and, and one thing after another and all of a sudden in a matter of a few moments, Job's whole world has been turned upside down and everything that he held dear is gone. From, he, from his possessions to his children, even his health now, as he's sitting there scraping himself with a pox shirt, everything that he's held dear is gone. Even his wife said, you should just curse God and die. Man, it, 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 your wife, I mean, that's supposed to be your dearest friend. Man, if you can't even confide in her, man, you're talking about a bad shape, bad place to be in. I'm not faulting her, by the way. I've heard a lot of preachers that have, and I'm not going to do that. We fail to realize sometimes she was the mother to the same children that Job lost. Those were her possessions as well. That was her husband that she was having to sit back and watch scrape himself with bulls from, the head, from his head to the bottom of his feet. I'm not faulting her tonight. When God told, told the devil, he said, have you considered my servant Job? He never said nothing about his wife. But they're one. When two get married, they become one, a husband and wife. What one goes to, the other one goes to with them. You're in this thing together and even though it may not be meant for you because you're with them, you're going through the same thing. I'm not faulting her at all tonight. But he ain't got nobody to talk to. He's just sitting there scraping himself. And he, he, he begins to tell his friends, he begins to talk about his pain. The Bible said in verse number 13, they come to see him. Verse number 12 says they didn't even know him. They didn't even recognize their friend. When they came and found him, he, he was in such bad shape. In chapter number 2, verse number 12, they didn't even know who he was. The Bible said they knew him not. Couldn't even tell who he was, didn't recognize him. The Bible said in verse number 13 at the end, it said, for they saw that his grief was very great. And then it goes on down to chapter number 3. Man, this caught my attention this evening. He said, for the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. This is something that he was afraid of, something he had feared. This was a thought that had entered his mind before. I had never thought about that till tonight. He had thought about this before. We've all had bad thoughts before. What if this happened? What if that happened? And one day it finally happened. I read on in chapter number six. He said, oh, that my grief in verse number two. Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity laid in the balances together. For now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words are swallowed up. He said, I'm hurting so bad I don't even know what to say. He said, you come. And he said, I don't even know what to tell you. 
He said, I'm hurting so bad. He he said, I just, words are not even able to describe what I'm going through and what I'm facing. He said, if my calamity and my grief were to be weighed, it outweigh the sands of the sea. You're talking about heavy grief. He goes on, just just to describe a picture. He goes on in chapter number 7, verse number 3. He said, so am I made to possess months of vanity. Listen to this. And wearisome nights are appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I rise? And the night be gone. I am full of tossings to and fro unto the dawning of the day. How many of you has had some sleepless nights? Something's troubling you and bothering you so bad you can't even sleep at night. You toss and turn in bed and you're just ready for night to be over with. You're just ready for sunshine, for the sun to come up and and ready for the darkness to be past and just ready to get it over with. You're not getting no rest, no sleep. Rest is running away from you and you're just tossing to and fro and you're just ready for night to be over with, ready to start another day and just to be done with it and be over with it. Couldn't sleep at night. He's hurting and he's troubled. He goes on in verse number 13. Listen to this. When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than life. He said, when I finally do go off to sleep and I do try to rest, I woke up with nightmares and dreams and, 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 I, and I'm tossing to and fro all over again. I can't get no sleep. I can't get no rest. My grief is so great and so heavy. Always oh, hurting. I can't imagine what he's going through. They've been people here recently that we've heard about going through great hurt and great pain and I can't imagine tonight what they're going through and how they feel. But I can't help but notice through his pain, notice there's some praise. The Bible said, chapter number 1, verse number 20, Then Job arose and ran his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. You've probably heard me mention this statement before. Our worship should never depend upon our circumstances. If our worship depends on our circumstances, it's pretty shallow worship. Because worshiping God is not worshiping for how things, how things are good in your life. I'm thankful when things are good in our life. But worshiping Him truly is worshiping Him for who He is. And who He is does not change with our circumstances. Amen. Who and what He is will never change. It's always the same. He's always God. Always been God. Always will be God. Always be worthy. Always be holy. Always be worthy of our praise, our worship. It does not matter how things are going in our lives. It does not change His status. At us. He's still worthy of our worship. If you'd quit letting your circumstances depend on how much you worship Him and just worship Him for who He is, you might get to a whole nother level. You might see things pick up. Your circumstances might not look so bad anymore if you just worship Him for who He is. Our worship should not depend on our circumstances. It should always depend on who He is and that never changes. Therefore, our worship should never change. I know it's not always like yet. But it ought to be. It should be. His praise. Then notice this with me, if you will. Notice his physicians. He had some friends come by. And I believe with all my heart. I really do. I believe with all my heart. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe with all my heart. Brother Benny, I believe they had good intentions. I really do. Brother Troy, I believe when they first showed up, they meant well. I really do. I believe with all my heart they did. I believe they had good intentions. The Bible said in verse number 11 of chapter number 2, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namanite, for they had made an appointment to come together, to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. They had good intentions. They, wasn't, they didn't come originally to beat and bash him and ridicule him and rebuke him and try to correct him and straighten him out. That wasn't what they came for intentionally. They came to mourn with him and to comfort him. That's what the Bible said. They lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they rent everyone his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. They sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights and none spake a word unto him for they saw that his grief was very great. They was doing good up to that point. They was doing well. Sometimes it helps just to have somebody to sit with. You don't have to say anything, just somebody to lean on, somebody to sit down and cry with you, just somebody to know that there's somebody there in your presence that's there for you and cares about you and just wants to be a shoulder to lean on. They was doing good up to that point. Till they opened their mouths. 
they were doing so good till then all of a sudden they felt the need to voice their opinion. That's all it was, was opinion. Amen. Nothing was backed by facts. We have to be very, very careful with our opinions. If you don't have facts to, to back it upon, you better be careful because you might not always be right. right These men believed probably with all their heart that they were right, but they were still wrong. It doesn't matter how much you believe that you're right. If you don't have the facts, you could be wrong. God help us to be careful. The last thing I want to be is what he called them. I believe it was in chapter number 13. He's talking to his friends. Chapter number 13, verse number 3 says, Surely I would speak to the Almighty and desire to reason with God. Listen to verse number 4. It says, But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Physicians the same thing we call a doctor. That's somebody we go to when we're hurting, when we're sick, when there's something wrong. We go to them looking for some help, looking for, looking for somebody to help us, to, to give us something to help, to give us instruction to help, somebody to help. That's what a physician is, somebody to help. But there have been times when people's gone to a physician looking for some help and they got what you call misdiagnosed. That's right, amen. They thought they knew, Brother Troy, what was wrong. Come to find out they didn't know after all. Now, doctors are smart people. They go to school for a long time and I believe they try. They use their equipment and their knowledge to the best of their ability, but they're not perfect. They're going to make mistakes just like you and I do. Once again, they're human as well. Right. Sometimes they may not always get it right. They have good intentions as well. But you can be misdiagnosed. That's a physician of no value. They are doing you no good if they keep misdiagnosing and don't, can't find your true problem. Right. They can treat you for anything and everything in the world, but until, you, until they treat you for what's really wrong, you're never going to get any better. Amen. Boy, they just kept trying to treat. And trying to treat and trying to treat. Job, we know what your problem is. You've messed up. You've done wrong. You need to get things right. You, need, you, 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 you shouldn't hate the Lord's di discipline. You, you, you need to get things fixed. Get right. This is all your fault. Well, they just kept treating and things wasn't getting any better. That's a physician of no value. I don't want to harp on that, but God help us not to be physicians of no value. Amen. Brother Eric, if I don't know beyond a shout out what's going on, It'd be best for me just sit and cry with them and not say nothing. I believe they was doing some good the first seven days, but things went downhill after that. He's told them in, verse, in chapter number 16, verse number 2, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. He said, I know what you came to do, but you're doing a terrible job of it. That's basically what he said. You meant well, and you meant to comfort, but you're just making things worse. He said in verse number 5, chapter number 13, after he called them physicians of no value, he said, oh, that you would all together hold your peace. He said, and it should be your wisdom. I haven't forgot, Brother Mark preached not too long ago on, on studying to be quiet. Boy, God help us to be quiet sometimes. My mouth sometimes gets me in, gets me in way worse, worse trouble than anything else I know of. Amen. One, one, one wise preacher told me one time, he said, God gave you one mouth and two ears. Yeah, yeah. He said, do a lot better, do twice as much listening as you do talking, and you'd probably be all right. Yes, sir. God help us not to be physicians of no value. Sometimes better just to pray and not say nothing at all. Just pray for them. But, but let me say this, and I'll move on. When you say you're going to pray for them, don't lie to them. People find comfort in knowing somebody's praying for them. I told some people I was, pre I was preaching tonight and I asked them earnestly from my heart to pray for me. I took comfort, Brother Richard, in believing that they going to pray for me. Right. Now, if you say you're going to pray for somebody and they find comfort, don't lie to them. Please do right. what you say you're going to do. Right. Don't let it just be wasted air. Do it. If, you're gonna, if you say you're going to do it, do it. Please do it. Then notice this very quickly. I'm moving on. Notice his plea. There's one thing that he wants through all this. Just one thing. He said, oh, that I might find God. See, that was what was troubling Job, I believe, worse than anything. Worse than losing everything that he held dear. He was coping with that. It was hurting him terribly, but he was coping with it. He said, Lord, give us. Lord, take it away. I believe he was handling that. It was hurting, but he was handling it. Even his wife saying, just curse God and die. I believe he was handling it. 
Sitting there scraping himself with all those bulls, I believe he was handling it. But what he could not handle, what he could not get over, what was bothering him the worst, Brother Eric, he said, I cannot find God. Right, amen. Through all this, the one thing that I need worse than anything, Brother Troy, I just need to find God. I believe with all my heart if I could just find God and find where he's at and be in his presence just one time, everything would be okay. Right. He would give me what I need and I'd be all right. Notice he said, I done read it, chapter number 13, verse number three, surely I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God. Notice chapter number 23, verse number two, it says, even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might even come to his seat. I would order my calls before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered from ever from my judge. Behold, I go forward. But he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the listen to this. On the left hand, where he doeth work. Even the normal places where he's usually at. Right. Even those places, Brother Jeremy, where I can usually count on him being there. The places where I'm found him the most, the places where he doeth work, even the normal places, I can't even find him there. That'd be like going to the house of God. That's a place you ought to expect God to be and where you'd expect to find Him. Even at the house of God, I can't find Him. Can't sense Him. I can't see Him. I can't find Him. I can't hear Him. Even the normal places, I cannot find Him. He said on the left, on the left where He doeth work, but I cannot behold Him. He hideth Himself on the right hand, but I cannot see Him. How many of you you may not have been going through the worst tragedy of your life like Job was, but you was going through a dry and, and just seeming a, just a mundane time in your life. Seemed like you wasn't getting nowhere. Seemed like you wasn't accomplishing nothing. And, and you just loved to hear from God just one more time. Seemed like you hadn't got to, really got to, really hadn't prayed through all the way, Brother Richard. Seemed like you just hadn't really gotten anywhere. It wasn't for lack of trying. But it seemed like you just wasn't getting anywhere. It's just dry. Just, just no matter how hard you try, there was something hindering, something blocking. And, and you've prayed and you confess. You've done everything you know to do. But you seem like you just cannot find Him. You get thirsty after a while and you just need a drink. Well, I don't know about you, but I'd gotten pretty thirsty. And Sunday morning, I'm glad, thank God, he come by and gave a drink. He, he, he'd been a little distant, brother, brother Scott, and I hadn't been able to find him as easy as normal. But I'm glad, thank God, Sunday morning, I didn't have no trouble finding him. Everywhere I looked, I was seeing him work, and I was seeing him move, and, and I was feeling him, and I was hearing him, he was speaking to me. And I'm thankful for when God comes by. Amen. But Job couldn't find him. So he came to one conclusion. This is, where, this is where my heart's at now. This is where I'm trying to get to. He came to one conclusion. He said, I don't know where God's at. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what he's doing or why this is happening in my life. And let me say to you right here, just because you can't find him does not, does not mean he don't know where you're at. Right. Right. Even Job said it himself. He said he hideth himself. Job wasn't saying that he's not there. He said, I just can't see him. I can't find him. Just because you can't see him or can't find him doesn't mean he's not there. He still knows exactly where you're at and exactly what you're going through and exactly what you need. He heard every conversation him and these men had. And he makes it right later on in the end. None of that went, 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 went by ahead from God. God knows every bit of it. Just because you can't find him don't mean he ain't there. I promise you, he ain't left you. He knows where you're at. You just may not be able to see him, but he's there, I promise. Amen. But Job come to this conclusion, this is where I want to get to. He said, though I can't find him, listen to the next verse, but he knoweth the way that I take. Amen. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He said, I can't find him. I've looked for him. I've, I, I've, I've prayed. I've sought after him, and I can't find him. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to my place and I'm going to wait on him. He said he knoweth the way that I take. What, what is the way that Job takes? Well, you got to go all the way back to chapter number one when he's talking about Job. You'll find the way that he takes. Amen. What, what way does he take, Brother Eric? Let's read chapter number one, verse number five again. 
Boy, God has really burned this in my heart lately. The Bible said, and it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that the sons, that my sons have sinned, God and cur sinned and cursed God in their heart. Listen to the next four words. I'm thankful for Holy Ghost inspired word of God. Amen. These four words meant a lot to me. What way does Job take? He knoweth the way that I take. What way does Job take? It said, thus he did continually. This was not something he'd done just ever so often or every once in a while. This was not just a one once a year thing or once a month thing or even once a week thing. This was something Job done continually. You say, what did he do? He burned offerings. So what are you getting at, preacher? He stayed at an altar. He, thus he did continually. Amen. He said, God knows the way that I take. Brother Scott, he said, I'm going back to where I always met him before. And even though I can't find him, I'm going to wait on him. Yes, sir. Amen. I could wait on him other places, but there's one place that he comes by real, real often. And me and him spend a lot of good time there. That's my place where I meet with God. And though I may not be able to see him, I may not be able to hear him, I may not be able to feel him, I'm going to go back to that place and I'm going to wait on him. Right. Amen. Amen. He knoweth the way that I... What way do you take? Where do you go continually? Where, where and when do you spend your time? What do you spend your time doing? What's important to you? See, that was important to Job. That's why he done it continually, because it was important to him. I'm going to take it a step further, Brother Eric. That was, God wasn't the only one that knew the way he took. I believe with all my heart, his children knew the way that he took as well. I believe with all my heart, they knew the way that he took his well. He is a godly man. And I don't believe it's hid from nobody. They knowed where God, they knowed where daddy spent his time. They knowed where Job went continually as well. Job wasn't at the house. I guarantee they know the first place to check, Brother Eric. They didn't have to go down there. All they had to do was look up and see smoke. Yep, daddy's down at the altar again. Daddy's down there meeting with God again. Daddy's down there burning again. Boy, God spoke my heart. And I, I, want that, I, want my, I want my boys to know, Brother Jeremy, what's important to me. I want them to know the way that I take. I want them to see their daddy continually and at an altar and getting along with God and, and burning offerings and sacrificing to God, giving my heart and my life to God. I want them to know the way that I take. I want it to be important to me. Thus he did continually. Not just an every once in a while thing. We're real good at passing fancies and just every once in a while things. I'm talking about this was, this was just who he was. You do something enough, it, that, that's what makes you you. And this is what made Job the man that he was. Amen. Thus he did continually. I'm going to take it even a step further. Job goes back to that altar, but this time things are different. Job doesn't have a sacrifice with him. Everything's gone. There's no oxen. There's no sheep. There's no none of that there. Everything's done gone. Everything's done been took away. He has nothing left to offer. But the Bible said in verse number 8 of chapter number 2, And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all. Listen to this. And he sat down among the ashes. Right. Not beside the ashes. Among the ashes. Right. In order for you to be among something, that means it's got to be all around you. You know what that tells me, Brother Carl? He didn't just sit beside that altar. But I believe he took it a step further. He said, God, I don't have anything else to offer. Everything's gone. Everything I've got is gone. But I do have me. And he climbed up there himself and sat on the middle of that altar himself and said, God, I've given you out. You've got everything I've got. I don't have anything else, but I've got me. And he climbed himself up on that altar. He sat among the ashes. He said, God, you've got everything. Job was a great man. And I'm not saying this is true about Job's life. It could have been. It may not have been. But it can definitely be true about mine and your life. That may have been what God wanted all along. That thought occurred to me. Now, I know God was bringing glory to himself. 
He was talking to the devil and he was bringing glory to himself. And like I said, I don't know if that's what God wanted from Job or not. It may have just been the glory. It may have, that, Brother Eric, that may have been all that God was interested in was just the glory. But it also could have been that this is also what God wanted from Job personally. You've given me a lot of things. You've given me a lot of time. We're close. We've spent a lot of time together. But more than your things, I really just want you. We're good at giving things. Even our wallets and our pocketbooks, we're real good at giving things. God, you can have this, you can have that. God's not so much interested in your things. He'll have all your things if He just has you. And He climbed Himself, I believe, and got on the altar Himself. God may sometimes let us go through things and to even maybe take some things from us just to have us. I don't know what you're going through and I don't know why you're going through it. I'm not saying that's why you're going through it. You may be just as sold out and, and given your heart to God more than anybody. That could be very true and I'm not saying it's not. But I know there's been many times in my life God let me go through things because He wanted me on that altar. Amen. I can give Him a lot of things all day long but what He really wants is just me. He wants Amen. my heart. He wants my desires. You can give things and give things and give things and still not ever get where God wants you to be. God wants us personally. I don't know if that done anything for you, but God's been dealing with my heart a long time about putting myself on the altar. Quit just giving things and give myself wholeheartedly to God and say you've got it all. Whatever you want with it, you can have it. My wants, my desires. I'll say this very quickly and I'm done. Notice he's passed. Chapter number 29. I'm right now through, I promise. Job chapter number 29. He begins to look back and reminisce a little bit. Chapter 29, verse number 2 says, Oh, that I were in as months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when His candle shined upon my head, and when His light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. Listen to verse number 5. When the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me. He's still hurting. He's looking back. I will say this very quickly and move on. Thank God for the good memories and what God's given you. But I've seen people, Brother Jeremy, waste the rest of their life living in a memory. And, and, and I'm not trying to fault them. Brother Benny, I'm not trying to fault nobody. But if all we do is live in a memory the rest of our lives, we're never going to accomplish anything else. We're never going to get anywhere with God. We're never going to... Losing a loved one hurts. And, I'm, and I thank God every day for the memories. But you can't live in those memories and forget about the people you still have with you today. There's other people still needing you today. They need you. They need you fully. They, they need your heart and they, they need your attention. They need help from you. Don't forget. Thank God for the past and for the memories, but don't forget the ones around you now, the ones that you still have. Don't focus on the ones that are gone so much that you forget the ones that God's still letting you have time with. I don't know who that was for, but I felt led to say it. And then obviously had a promotion. I'm done. God promoted him. Amen. I'm thankful for what it, what it said there in the last verse of chapter 1. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He wished a lot of things and said a lot of things. He was hurting, and you and I would too. He said he wished he had never been born, or he wished he had died as soon as his mother birthed him into the world. He said a lot of things, but he never charged God foolishly. He was hurting, but he never charged God foolishly. And God rewarded him for it. God promoted him. He gave him twice as much as everything he had. But something that jumped out at me studying this this evening real quick before we came to church. I was reading about this. I've read it several times before. Like I said, I've been, I've been dealing with this, with this book for over a year now and God gives me something different every time I read it. But I was reading it this evening. Like I said, those conversations didn't go, go by unnoticed. God heard every one of them. And God was angry about them as well. God was ready to pour His wrath out on those three friends. He said, y'all haven't re represented me right. You've not spoken right about me. 
But he goes on and tells them in verse number 8, the Lord's talking to the three friends. He said, Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up yourselves a burnt offering. He said, Y'all need to go spend some time on the altar like Job has. Right. Amen. God help us for getting on to somebody else if we ain't spent no time on an altar. Right. He said, Y'all need to go to the altar. He said, Listen to this. My servant Job shall pray for you, and for him I will accept lest I deal with you after your fall. He said, I ain't, got no, I ain't listening to nothing you got to say right now until Job prays on your behalf. Right. Till Job forgives you and lets everything be okay, I'm not going to let it be okay. But I'm going to go even a step further than that. There was com some conditions on Job's behalf too. This, this is what caught my attention. The Bible said, verse number 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed. Amen. The thought hit me tonight, Brother Carl. Yeah. Had Job not been willing to forgive his friends, would God ever promoted him? He didn't charge God, he didn't charge God foolishly. He done right, Brother Nicholas. But there's one more thing he had to do. God told him, he said, you got to forgive your friends. Amen. You're not ever going to get where God wants you to be if you can't forgive. Yes, there's going to be things and people hurt you. That's just part of life. We're going to let each other down. Your, your, your most dearest loved ones are going to hurt you. It's going to happen. That's, we're human. We mess up. It, whether intentionally or unintentionally, people and things are going to hurt you. But if you're going to get anywhere with God, you're going to have to be able to forgive. You've Amen. got to forgive. The Bible said, when he prayed. He didn't say before he prayed. He right. said after yeah. he prayed. That spurs a thought in my head. I don't know. I don't know this to be true or not, but it spurred an awful big thought in my head. Would God still promote him if he hadn't have forgave him? I'm glad he did and God did. That's all, that's all that matters. And I'm glad God, I'm glad he did and God did. But just for you and I, but for our sake tonight, what God might do for us if we'd just be able to forgive. Man, we love each other and we hurt each other a lot of times and don't even mean to. That's brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters of Christ. My sisters, I love them dearly. Man, there's times they hurt me deep. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about in my heart. Say things, do things. Get caught up in a moment. Get caught up, get mad about something. We're part of the family of God and we ain't perfect yet. We ain't got to heaven yet. We're going to mess up. We're going to hurt each other's feelings. That, that happens. You got to be able to forgive and get over it. Amen. Get by it. I'm thankful. I'm thankful we will. God will take care of the rest. God promote him. God gave him twice of everything Amen. he had. You say one thing he didn't give him twice, preacher. He gave him only ten children back. But he still got to take, keep the ten before as well. They were in heaven. You see, God don't always answer our prayers like we want him to. God did double his children. He just didn't have them all 20 at the same time. God had 10 waiting on him in heaven and God gave him 10 more. He still had twice as many children. He just had to wait a little bit longer before he got to see some of them again. Amen. Like I said, God don't always answer our prayers like we want him to or like we think he should. But I'm glad he does answer. Been times when I prayed for that loved one to get better and things to be different and that's exactly what happened. They did get better. Just wasn't quite the way I was looking for. I don't know your heart tonight. I hope I didn't, I hope I wasn't too scattered. I, I covered a pretty broad area. God just been giving me more and more and more. And I thank God for it tonight. And when, when you're bubbling and when God's giving you a bunch, you want, you want to share it. You want to get it off your heart. I hope I wasn't scattered tonight. But I hope and pray that God used his word to be a help to you tonight. I don't know where you're at. Maybe things are going fine for you, but you know somebody that they ain't going fine for. Maybe you need to be one of those good physicians, one of those good comforters and come pray for them on their behalf. I don't know your heart. Maybe something's going on in your life. Maybe you need to climb on an altar. Maybe, maybe you need to forgive somebody or ask God to forgive you. I don't know your heart. But I've done my best to share with you what God put on mine. I love you and I thank God for it. I thank God for our church where God's put us. I appreciate the opportunity to preach you come here. Amen. Amen. I'm Pastor Mark Biddy, and I would like to thank you for watching our live stream services today. 
We would also like to invite you to visit with us in our church. But before you go, there are a few things we'd really like for you to know. One, the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's every man, woman, boy, and girl at some point in time has sinned in their life and we were born in sin. Because of that, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. But that's not all the Word of God says. The good news is that same verse goes on to tell us, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans 5, 8, the Word of God says, but God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the good news today is you can accept Christ right now as your Savior. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We also know that the Bible tells us Jesus is given an open invitation. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. That is the invitation from Christ himself. Thank you again for watching our live stream services. We look forward to ministering to you again in the near future. May the Lord bless you.